everybody uh, comfortable? Uh, welcome to uh, the Dulwich Hamlet Supporters Trust RC Expert evening on fan ownership. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think this is a bigger turnout than we expected, so thanks for coming here on this cold night. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Fiona Skurlock. I'm on the board of the uh, Trust and I was co-opted onto the board in September 2014 uh, and I lead on the fan ownership issue. Um, hopefully you've been able to read the Trust's latest statement, uh, their position on all the issues surrounding uh, redevelopment and um, fan ownership. Uh, that's on the website. One of the key areas, uh, there are three areas, one of which is fan ownership. Um, the trust view is that in the future, Dulwich Hamlet should be fan owned. Um, and following Hadley's purchase of the ground and the club last year, um, we've got a fantastic opportunity to achieve this aim. Hadley's plans for the redevelopment of the ground include a commitment to passing the ownership of the club to the fans um, in the long term. And so we organised this evening tonight and we're very fortunate to have um, a, a range of highly experienced and knowledgeable guests to guide us through what is quite a complex area. Um, I'll just introduce uh, the guests. Uh, James Maybe is from the club development arm of Supporters Direct. Uh, Paul Millington is the vice chair of Enfield Town FC. Um, he was one of the founders of that club, which was uh, the first fan-owned club in the country. Uh, Dan York, you might um, recognise, he's the club secretary of Fisher FC. Uh, Fisher is owned and run by the Fisher Supporters Trust. Joe Collins is legal advisor and assistant secretary of the Pompey Supporters Trust. She was a member of the steering group which set up the Supporters Trust and was its first chair. And at the end there we've got Nigel Higgs from AFC Wimbledon. He was part of the working group that set up the Dons Trust in 2001 and is on the board of the Trust following nine years as youth and community director at AFC Wimbledon. Um, and can we just thank all our guests for coming tonight. So I'm going to ask James Maybe to give us um, an overview of the various options uh, for fan ownership, the structures, benefits, drawbacks uh, associated with each of those. Uh, then each of the speakers will give uh, a short synopsis on their club, how it's structured, um, how it's run, and the day-to-day -day, uh, challenges um, involved in that. So you then have an opportunity to ask questions. So I hope you will um, make use of the experience we've got on the panel here tonight. At the end of the evening, the raffle will be drawn. Okay, so James, over to you. Well, uh, thanks very much for having me along. It's a um, good experience. First time I've ever been able to sit by the table with a nice carafe of water and fresh lime, man. Looks like mint in there. So, uh, sign of the times, which is fantastic. Um, so, we, we are supposedly experts, but unfortunately uh, I couldn't get the TV to work to plug into my computer, uh, so there is no presentation. So uh, make of that what you will in terms of expertise. Um, but what we'll, perhaps it's no bad thing because a 20 page um, PowerPoint presentation is probably not what you want to do after a day at work. So um, I think I've only got about 10 minutes to speak and uh, certainly the guys next to me who I know uh, very well who have got um, far more experience of actually doing this stuff for real um, so I won't um, try and erode into their time too much but I will just summarise a little bit about Supporters Direct what we um, have 
done and what we do. Um, and then I would imagine that quite a lot of the questions would be things that perhaps we can get into discussion about because you know a lot of um, these things, these questions come up in various different clubs, um, and, and you know people are probably thinking the same sort of thing. So. I'll quickly run through um, Supporters Direct. So we've been around since 1999. Um, primarily we were set up to help supporters of English football clubs um, get closer to their uh, clubs, to get closer to their communities by setting up these independent groups like the Dulwich Hannah Supporters Trust. Um, there's now 190 Supporters Trusts with a combined membership of uh, three quarters of a million um, and these groups over the time have, have raised more than £40 million pounds, and the work that has happened in the UK has inspired a lot of groups across Europe and um, there's, uh, I'd say I don't take credit for everything because a lot of the countries are far more developed than we are in, in terms of support or ownership but um, we're now fortunate to work in I think it's 23 European countries where there's similar support to trust, there's similar debates about support or ownership going on. Um, as I said, some of them are far more developed, like in Germany, than they are over here. Um, so, really for us, it's, um, in this case, it's a job of not just thinking about the supporters' trust and how they can work with the club, but clearly we're here to find out or to, to talk about whether supporters can own this football club. And although we originally was set out to set up these supporters trusts over time um, not long in Paul's case being the first lot but um, supporters were taking ownership of clubs through various different circumstances I've got a fantastic pie chart which uh, you can't see on that but um, I'll summarize it because I think it is helpful with, with some of the questions in that uh, we put it into four categories really so one category we'd call uh, a reformed club, so where often these support or ownership opportunities come around where there's been an insolvency, where there's been a problem. Um, so if you think of Chester City, if you think of um, what's it called? Um, uh, Russian and Diamonds recently, Hinkley last season, where the club's gone bust and they've started at the bottom of the pyramid, they've reformed as a support or owned club and they're working their way back up. Then there's a uh, call of like an acquisition, where uh, often, where again, where the club's in insolvency, in administration, but it's stayed in the same um, league. So uh, Portsmouth being a prime example, um, Wrexham or another, where the supporters have galvanised and, and come up with their own bin and taken control of the club. Um, there's a couple of, sort of new starts, the FC United's, um, at the, at the pioneer of that really uh, and then there's what I think is probably most relevant to tonight which is a sort of development really where the club for whatever reason uh, in a friendly way so no insolvency thank God um, decides to uh, consider support or ownership and obviously that's in different circumstances um, but ideally in a friendly way, so we're not trying to raise X amount of money in, you know, two weeks ago and, you know, we don't really have a clue what we're going to do and, you know, so we've got a chance really to actually do it properly, talk about it, see if people are interested in it. And I can assure you it's a far more enjoyable experience for us and for everyone else, I think, um, because at least you can feel confident that you're going to get to see your football team week in, week out, whereas... Um, you know, some of the other situations, this room would be absolutely packed and people would be wondering whether they're going to have a club, have a ground, etc. So, um, probably five minutes in already. Another fantastic slide to show you, imagine it, there's 40 uh, clubs really in the UK that follow this model and this table is actually a good spectrum of those. So there's uh, four League Two clubs, there's, there's Pompey, Joe down the end, there's AFC Wimbledon with Nigel, um, there's Exeter City, and there is, oh God, Jesus, Wickham Wanderers. Um, 
this is on camera, I apologise to Wicked because I'm doing a lot of work with them at the moment. Then there's uh, Interconference Premier, you've got Chester, you've got Wrexham, you've got Everton Talbot, and it goes right down to, down the pyramid to um, uh, clubs that are, are playing in sort of step six, seven or so, stuff from Bolton Towns and Fishers and, and people that really... Step five, James. Sort of step five. <laughs> Ouch. Right. Um, that followed exactly the same model, believe it or not, um, and almost the identical rules, believe it or not, um, but obviously you have significantly different um, issues and size and turnover of things, but basically buy into the same principle. Now, what is quite nice at the moment, and in the last couple of years I'd say, is a lot of clubs like yourselves are taking in, or supporters as well, are taking an interest in this model. A lot of it's down to the likes of your own fields that are playing, and from town, sorry, that are playing these teams week in, week out. Other supporters are looking on and saying, okay, hang on a minute, why can't we have a piece of that? And owners, you know, um, uh, are looking at it and saying, well, you know, I don't want the burden of running this club, or who's going to take on this club? You know, is the answer actually amongst the support base and community? So it's, um, there's, there's a kind of a group of others, and I've, I've bumped into a Dorchester Town fan here and, and they're the latest just over Christmas to vote for their big on-pitch problems at the moment but they're trying to sort things out off the pitch which we think is the way to go to then uh, have a better chance on the pitch. So, uh, speak quickly, yeah. I know you like to talk, Joe. No, I'm joking. Um, so, uh, what I might do, rather than get into the, the, the real technical legal structures, is to say that we can go into this if people want to. There's always someone at the club that really wants to, and that's fine. Um, we can do that maybe in the questions. Here's some questions that I put down that I thought may reflect your feelings of what you're thinking, and you know we can maybe discuss these at the end with the panel. But things like, uh, okay, if supporters own, if supporters take over their club, you know, where's where's the money coming from? How are you going to have a successful team? Who's going to make the decisions? How are you going to have 200 odd people making decisions at the club? Um, what about Ebbsfleet? Ebbsfleet, you know, that's one that often comes up and, and you know we can talk about why that's different if people want to go there. Um, will we be competitive? What will it cost to join? Can volunteers actually do this? We're talking about a completely different thing from running a supporters trust to a, uh, a football club that might be turning over hundreds of thousands, even millions, um, and looking after important facilities in the local community. Um, how does this relate to the proposed ground development? Um, I'm sure some of you can answer that better than I can, but it's an important thing we need to consider. Uh, is 100% ownership by supporters important? Um, you know, again, these are questions that, I, that come to me time and time again, and you, you've probably got others. So perhaps best now to just leave those floating around, and um, I'll let these guys who uh, do, as I said, the, the, fantastic work out there, clubs on the ground, and maybe it will bring you some answers, hopefully, into the debate at the end. So, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you to the Trust for inviting me along this evening. It's always great to uh, visit this great club. Um, I've had many visits here in the past supporting the now defunct Enfield Football Club, and while I was uh, 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 going through uh, uh, putting my Christmas decorations back in the loft. I went through the boxes of uh, programs that I've got there that insulate my loft to find a copy of the first visit I ever made here to Champion Hill. Um, December 1974. I know you're thinking it can't possibly be that old. <laughs> I am. Um, and everything was right in the world. The Rothmans were uh, uh, sponsoring the uh, Eastern League. So the players were getting a packet of 20 after every game. <laughs> Even better, the Peckham Mutual was offering 7.75% of your, uh, your savings. But even better than that, Dulwich was second in the league, uh, but the mighty Enfield were top. <laughs> My recollection of that day is that Enfield won that game 3-2 uh, and went on to win the uh, Eastman League that year and went on to win it for a further two years in a row as well. Uh, they were golden times for that club. 
uh, six visits to Wembley, uh, an annual FA Cup giant killing, and uh, we won the conference two years, uh, and the last year being the year of automatic promotion. We thought those the days would never go away, uh, and nothing could possibly go wrong. Well, it went very, very wrong, very dramatically. And in 1999, uh, the owner sold the ground, the club was playing outside the borough and was in the administration. To cut a very long story, very short, in 2001 the supporters voted to start Enfield Town. Uh, and we started off at the bottom rung, uh, step five in football. Um, and obviously we've worked our way up to be competing with the likes of yourselves now. So I think it shows, together with this great success story of our friends at AFC Wimbledon, that fans owned clubs will compete at the best level and they can actually put teams out there that will provide the community with the club that they expect. Um, off the pitch though, we need to be as successful and certainly organised. Um, we had our crowning moment of moving into our new stadium, the Queen Elizabeth II in 2011, um, but just importantly as well, uh, we developed our youth teams because we wanted to make sure that we were giving all parts of our community the option to partake in their local club. We run disabilities teams as well and we are now the second biggest club in Middlesex which is no mean achievement. Um, our structure is one of a community benefit society and we'll probably get into detail of that but effectively it's the trust. So the trust which we have it. currently, our membership floats between 200 and 300. At the moment we've just got over 200 members. So they pay their £10 membership a year, they're entitled to a vote and it's a democratic, not-for-profit organisation, one person, one vote. Importantly, the society, the trust, owns the ground. That means that ground could never be sold without the majority, I believe it's 75% of the membership voting to do so. So we're securing our ground for future generations. Below that we have a wholly owned limited company that carries out the trading activities for the club. We have a board of 12 directors from all walks of life, but all with a passion for the football club. But more importantly, I believe, we have um, lots of volunteers that do important jobs around the club, without which really our club wouldn't exist. And I think that's one of the benefits of owning, having a supporters own club. Everybody feels that it is their club. You don't have to be a director to have an involvement in the club. So one of the points that uh, uh, James has made there about uh, uh, the questions you may have is how do you fund your club? Um, now for us, uh, we've had a major expense of moving into a new ground in 2011. Um, and we've had to take loans out to do that. But we have now got a budget that we believe, from talking to other clubs, is probably middle of the table budget within the Ryman Premier League. Um, the first two seasons in this league, it was certainly bottom three, and that's nearly where we ended up for the first two years as well. Uh, but now we're doing better, and it's a gradual progression year on year as to what we can afford. We have, say, around 200 members, and we have from those 200 members, we have regular subscriptions from around 60 of those who make monthly contributions. And we also have regular contributions as well, one-off contributions from supporters, members. And we found certainly our experience is that supporters who are members are much more willing to get involved in their club and much more willing to actually contribute financially, but not just financially, in volunteering for doing many jobs as well. Those donations give us about 20% of our turnover. Our match day income gives us about another 30%. And our bar hire and bar income, another 30%. Our sponsorship provides us with the remaining 20%. And this is a very difficult area. I think every club wrestles with this, of getting sponsorship in. Um, but we have found that we've got uh, um, some regular sponsors now that have uh, been with us for several years and they like the idea that they are contributing to a community club and that they're not just funding somebody else's club and that they know every penny that gets provided in terms of sponsorship or advertising that actually gets passed into the club and is used in the club in some way. Certainly being a club, uh, a supporter's own club, 
um, was a major factor in finding favour with our local council uh, to get our new ground. Uh, we put a significant investment into the ground as well as the council and to demonstrate commitment to both uh, uh, the community, both ourselves and the council, we agreed on a 99 year lease. Now that was important for us. We wanted a 99 year lease, we wanted that longevity to show that we're there for the long term, the ground is secure, the club is secure for future generations. And now that uh, we've got that 99 year lease, it puts us in a strong position to go out because we've already basically outgrown our ground. We need to put in a new clubhouse and we're thinking about putting a new stand in and perhaps some artificial pitches as well to generate income. So we're looking at raising finance and the main benefit in, or assistance in raising that finance is that we have that 99 year lease behind us. I just want to go through a couple of misconceptions which uh, James did touch on in, in, in his introduction. Um, the first is that, uh, uh, well, we've got so many shareholders, how on earth do you make a decision? Well, it's quite simple really, you elect a board. And it's even better than that, if you don't like what the board are doing, you can vote them off. Or, if you think you can do a better job, you can then vote yourself in and give it a go. So, that works for us. We have to make decisions all the time, sometimes as the board, or we also uh, um, have various committees. So there's a stadium management committee, there's a committee that looks after the player administration, there's a committee that looks after the social side, and a committee that looks after the stadium management. And they're all given their own little budgets. They need to spend more money, and they come to the board, make a case, we make a decision. But that's all done within a board, and it's usually done very quickly. The second uh, misconception is that it's a clear fact that we as supporters know better than any manager what team we should put out there. Um, and so therefore, we as supporters will be dictating to the manager every week who should play and what substitutes he should put out there, etc. Uh, well, that just doesn't happen. Uh, you appoint the manager, the manager gets on, with doing the job. And he's got the most difficult job because we as supporters, we choose that team at five o'clock in the bar after the game. He has to choose it for kickoff at three o'clock. So he, he's got the hardest job in the club and that's where he gets the, he needs the board support to do that. Um, and finally, just going back to my programme, of the 22 clubs that were in the Rothman Isthmian League Division One at the time, of those 22 clubs, six have lost their grounds and no longer exist. Now I'm not saying that if they were in supporter ownership that that would have been any different. But certainly supporter ownership is the way that you can absolutely guarantee your club will be here for generations to come. And I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Paul. Um, and thanks to the Dulwich Supporters Trust for inviting me along. Uh, I'm Dan from Fisher. I'm very familiar with Champion Hill for reasons that I will explain. Uh, to those who don't know the, uh, the recent history of Fisher and Fisher Athletic. Um, Fisher, a relatively famous non-league name. Um, Fisher Athletic spent some time in the conference in the 80s uh, and then went into steady decline. Um, all the way into kind of the early 2000s, which is when I started going to watch. Uh, when I went there at step four, money was clearly tight. They were owned by uh, a local businessman, uh, and the ground was council owned. So, and uh, anyone who went to Surrey Dock Stadium will know it was an excellent non league ground, fairly secure, owned by the council. It was publicly funded in the first place. Uh, and then in 2003, the club was bought by uh, a businessman property developer, uh, words to make you nervous, apologies to any Hadley reps in the room, but when you're taken over by a property developer, it is time to start worrying. Um, uh, a guy called Sammy, um, he convinced the council uh, to sell freehold on the Surrey Dock Stadium to him, or to the club. Um, he bought it for what appears to be a knockdown price promptly moved it into one of his other, other companies um, and then a year later he moved Fisher from that ground, our home in Rotherhive, uh, Fisher's roots start in Birmingham in 1908, 
um, and the club had been playing in the background since the 80s, uh, moved us here, um, uh, which is lovely, but, but not home. Um, and so since 2004, um, Fisher have been playing here. In the meantime, the Surrey Dock Stadium, that fantastic ground lay derelict. Sammy did manage to achieve planning permission to redevelop it, but never managed to do that, and that's possibly because he mortgaged the ground uh, and spent the money on the first team. So for a while, um, despite playing here, Fisher's first team uh, was pretty good. Um, various promotions, beat AFC Wimbledon, um, not that they're still bitter. Um, all, all was lovely, um, uh, until of course, the money ran out in 2009, uh, it ran out rapidly, um, and at the end of that season we were finished last in the Conference South and Fisher Athletic were liquidated in May 2009. Um, we reformed, we got a group of fans together, um, reformed uh, as a fan owned club that same month um, and since then we have been as Fisher FC wholly uh, supporter owned and run um, and playing in uh, what was the Kent Premier League, it's now the Southern, Southern Counties East Football League. Um, but we were starting from a really tough base, so we had no assets, um, no ground, no league place at that point, and no money. Um, and probably the biggest issues for us is the lack of a ground. So losing, losing your key asset um, is almost the death knell for, for any club. But actually beyond that, we've been playing away from home uh, for five years. And in that time, Fisher, the club, had neglected its community. He hadn't done any work in the local community. The youth teams drifted away. The focus was entirely on the first team. There had been no attempt to widen the fan base. It's very difficult. If you're not, if you're not playing in your home community, you can't uh, expand your, your fan base. You're, you're in someone else's fan base. Um, so it, it's, it's been a bit of a tough slog, and, and the focus since reforming has been on getting home. Um, so if you look at our league record, it's probably not, not that impressive. We, um, we bumped around the, the bottom end at step five, keeping our heads above water. Uh, we hope to do that again this year, but, but actually the fans, when we reformed, were very clear. We want to play football, we want to, but we want to get home, and we want to really start building the club again. Um, in the last couple of years, things have moved on. So we've now got planning permission for a new ground back in Rotherhithe. It is opposite uh, the Surrey Dog Stadium. We hope to be in there during next season. Um, I would echo Paul's point that in our dealings with the council, our status as a not-for-profit, community-owned club has been incredibly helpful in, um, in ensuring they want to work with us. I think it's fair to say that, that Fisher's history uh, is not so benign. So even before Sammy, uh, Fisher have a history of um, interesting owners with interesting business interests. Um, so, so when we first walked into a meeting with the council and they heard we were from Fisher, you could almost feel the, the tension in the room uh, that Fisher were back, we thought you died, here you are again. Um, and it's taken quite some time to, to, to work with them and convince them that actually we're different. There's a reason we didn't want to be Fisher Athletic again, we did want to change the name. We, we share a history, we share a support base, but we're a different club and we want to do things differently. We want to be successful again, um, but success isn't, for us, isn't just about climbing the leagues, although we'd like to get out of Step 5 eventually. But it's about really rebuilding a community club that died a death under private ownership over a number of years. I think the opportunity for Dulwich is, is much, much greater. If, if as, uh, as James has outlined, if you can transfer into community ownership from the incredible base you've got now, um, fantastic crowds, fantastic community work, all done by, by you guys, um, not, not by anyone else, um, I think there's every chance to Dulwich and continue to progress um, and be even more of an asset to this community than, than they are now. Uh, so I would urge you to go for it. Thank you. Good evening. Is that too much? Many
thanks, Fiona, for inviting me. Um, it may be obvious to the very observant among you that I'm not a Southampton fan. <laughs> Neither am I as famous as the most famous Pompey fan, John Westwood, but I am alleged to be able to play the trumpet rather better than he plays the bugle. <laughs> but I'm not going to be playing trumpets tonight. That's not the night to do it. What you've already heard, uh, and by the way, I was a little alarmed when James mentioned the word expert. Um, because as an ex-lawyer, I will remember one particular case where we were subjected to expert evidence for two days, at the end of which the judge said, very profoundly, you know, the trouble with experts is they know more and more about less and less until eventually they know everything about nothing. <laughs> now, I hope that's not the case amongst the five of us. You've heard quite a lot already from my esteemed colleagues. I'll summarise uh, the present situation at Pompey thus. If anybody wants to delve into the, the history of the trust and what went on at Portsmouth, then you can just go on to the Portsmouth website and look at the history section, because I'm getting towards the end of telling the story from day one. And I think probably most of you in this room um, pretty well remember what Pompey Football Club went through post FA Cup win in 2008, when we went into financial meltdown in an absolutely big way. We've been tumbling down the league ever since, but in, during that time, we set up the trust and have successfully acquired the ownership of the club, the ground, the land around the ground, and we're currently in the process of moving on to redevelopment of the ground in conjunction with Tesco's. And before anybody does ask that question, we have got the money in an escrow account, and Tesco have confirmed that despite rumours to the contrary, they will not, they will build the new store and they will not then close it immediately. It is going ahead. How are we structured? Well, you've heard something about structure. This is the way Pompey is now structured. I won't go back to the history of how it got there, but we're very, very similar along the lines to Enfield. We have the trust itself, which is a community orientated trust. We did change some of the rules and regulations early on to allow trust members to buy shares within the trust and the trust then bought shares within the company Portsmouth Community Football Club Limited that effectively operates what is the trading arm which is the Portsmouth Football Club. Okay. Currently, there are something like, off the top of my head, 5,661 shares within PCFC Limited. Around about 2,600 are held by the trust on the basis of individuals having purchased a thousand pound share individually, although we do have a proportion of what are called group shareholdings, that is to say two, three, four, five, maybe ten of you putting in an equal amount towards a £1,000 share and then having a named shareholder. The structure of the trust is very similar. We have our own rules and regulations governing things like elections of board members, dealing with all the affairs of the trust itself. But the trust board actually then elects or chooses from amongst its elected members three people to go forward and sit as directors on the board of PCFC Limited. So we have three directors on the company board whose job is to represent the interest of the trust and therefore the members. So there's a, there's a, there's a line there. The trust holds approximately a 48% control. Now, some people see that as disappointing because at one time we did hold 52%.
But as money has kept on coming in from um, what are described as presidents or HNWs as they start off being held, it's tipped the balance. However, I, I do want to emphasize that holding 51% against, say, 49% or 52-48 against what are perceived to be big owners on the other side of the fence, in, so, in many respects, it's, it's um, symbolic because I can tell you that we have 16 presidents, 14 of whom are lifelong Pompey fans, season ticket holders, eight of whom who have also put money into the trust itself and are members of the trust. Effectively, you could say that Pompey is owned by 98.5% Pompey fans, one way or another. The presidents have injected minimum 50,000 upwards to 600,000 pounds in to the operating of the club through the company. So they all hold, someone who's put in 600,000 has 600 shares. Someone who's put in 50,000 holds 50 shares based on the thousand pounds example. We also have what's called a shareholders agreement signed by the trust in conjunction with the president. And that really is your controlling document on the way that Poppy is set up. It is not the trust who make the decisions as regards day-to-day -day operation of the club. That's down to the CEO. But there are certain what are called um, protected matters. Um, I think that's the right word. I slightly lost the thread on that one. Some of which require a 75% vote by the shareholders to approve. Others which, which require 90%. So in order for something, for instance, you need it's a form of protection against, let's say, a megalomaniac billionaire owner coming along and offering to buy out shares bit by bit, piece by piece, picking them off one by one and acquiring ownership of the club under one single ownership. In order to do that, the shareholder who may want to sell would have to get the agreement of 75% of all the other shareholders. To achieve that. Am I, am I creating a picture here for you? Now whether you'll be able to achieve that I don't know. Portsmouth is probably the biggest example um, in the league structure of trust ownership on the basis that you include the presidents as supporters. And I think I've probably reached the end of what I want to say to you at this juncture, because I'm sure you're going to have questions asked over and above anything we've had to say so far. Thank you, Joe. Hey, thanks. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, and thanks to Fiona and the Chamberlain Supporters Society. Supporters Trust. Sorry. Supporters Trust. Um, for inviting me along to speak. Hopefully I can uh, fulfill the expectation of being next to it, but uh, it will be the first time that's ever been, uh, that's what title has ever been given to me. I think I, I don't know, obviously you guys have uh, been watching Dutch Hammond a lot longer than, than I've encountered them, but um, I, my recollection is we've played you twice. Um, once in our second ever game in 2002 in a friendly, when you beat us, and the second time in a London Senior Cup game. Was it twice in London? Twice, yeah. Home and away. Uh, your place. Yeah, home and away, I think. Uh, London was at your place. Was it? We played a few times in the league as well. Yeah. Oh, that's true, yeah, of course. Um, came, came to this place many times, but it doesn't hold that on memories for me because of uh, what Dan was saying about the, uh, the last time we came here into the boardroom um, when we played Fisher Athletic in the Roman Prem um, semi-final and got knocked out by one of those um, well-funded teams that Fisher had at that time. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I've got fond memories of coming here. I always enjoyed coming to this bar and I hope this evening we'll be able to 
and another good evening for, for all you guys. And I hope I can, you know, share some of our experiences and, and explain a bit about where I think you know the biggest challenges are um, and how that might be able to help you guys. Um, I think the, 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 the in terms of how we formed and what our story is, I think we've had um, a number of bits of good fortune in our existence. Um, in the run-up to um, the story of Austin Milton Keynes um, taking away the football club, the board of directors of Wimbledon FC, a very successful Premier League club, um, <coughs> had recently bought it off Sam Aman, who, who was the chap who sold Plough Lane from underneath Wimbledon FC, which had been their home for many, many years. And one of the reasons why Enfield managed to do well in the Eastman League there is because um, women had recently gone into the Southern League and uh, given them a chance. But uh, they, um, that old ground was, um, uh, was a subject really of a, of a kind of a property snatch. Um, the, 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 they wanted to build a hypermarket there, they wanted to make money out of the football club. And basically they sold it from underneath, uh, underneath the, the fans' noses. So the fans became, I'd say, you know, as the fans became radicalised and um, became, began to become more vociferous um, and try to stand up for their rights. But if you're not in a support, supporters trust or you don't have any kind of legal entity status, then um, you can't really do anything. You can do bucket collection, you can give the money to, um, to the board and the board will, you know, spend it on whatever they want to spend it on and you'll have nothing to show for it at the end of it. So our, our sort of piece of good fortune there really was that um, in the year before the, the whole Milton Keynes thing happened, um, and there'd been many sort of um, ideas that these guys had had up until then, where they wanted to move Wimbledon to, to share with Bristol Palace, to become um, you know, part of Queen's Park Rangers, to move to Dublin was the, the one after that. So uh, there'd been quite a lot of protesting which had got nowhere. Um, and the Independent Supporters Association came across the, what we, we called in the early days, I mean, quite rightly so, the inspiration of Brian Lomax, who was the, the driving force behind forming supporters' threat. And um, Brian and Dave Boyle came down to our Independent Supporters Association one evening and inspired us to, to start Sports Trust. And we, we started that off around about October of 2001, did a formal launch in February 2002, um, which really was, as I say, just in the nick of time, because by May the 28th of that year, the Wimbledon Football Club was um, having the nails hammered in his coffin and heading off up the M1. So um, we were very fortunate then that, you know, people had thought ahead about what we would do if that happened, and um, we decided, effectively, that we would try to start our own club, that's why I guys like Mark Enfield. Um, that it could be done, um, and that we really we, had, we didn't have many choices. We could go 60 miles up the, the M1 and support a different club in a different town, go and watch Fulham, or we could create our own club. And um, the Fulham option wasn't very attractive to most of us, but um, neither was going up the M1. So that, that's what, what happened and what we decided to do. So once that had actually um, been accepted by the London Football Association, we were able to, um, to, to then pass over ownership from the guys who had actually formed the club, and it's a limited company, which was formed originally, that you needed to form a limited company, get into the FA, and then um, see if you could get a league to play in and the ground to play on. Um, but um, in, a, in a meeting shortly after that actually happened, on the day of the announcement, um, the next day when they formed the club, um, the fans, the members, non-members of the Don's Trust, it's actually the Don's Trust is like a, um, a label, a, you know, a brand name that's given to it. It's actually the official title is the Wimbledon Football Club Supporters Society. Um, it's known as the Don's Trust, so that's how I can refer to it this evening as well. Um, the, 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 the meeting subsequent to that voted unanimously. I don't think there was anybody voting against. It's a bit like a Gibraltar referendum for whether they should go to Spain or not. There weren't many antis, uh, if any. And, um, we decided that we would, you know, take ownership of the club from that um, that, that group. The shares were passed over to the Don's Trust, and we set about, you know, starting the club. So, so our good fortune really was to come across Supporters Direct, and um, you know, they're a great organisation. And, and we've met James several times. Um, he's closely involved with the work we're doing around um, doing a community share issue around our proposed new ground back in Plough Lane. 
Um, so, yeah, that, that, that was one of our strokes of good fortune. Um, the other one really was, and I think it's been mentioned as well by the other speakers, is that we actually had a ground to play in. Um, and it was our good fortune and, and Kingstonian's misfortune that they'd been um, poorly run, fallen to administration, had a crisis, and were owned by someone who wasn't a really football man, who may well have had interests in um, doing something else with the ground and the ownership of the club rather than turning into a thriving and non league club. So um, it was our good fortune that they agreed to a ground share. It was our good fortune that over 4,000 fans came with us um, and uh, enabled us to then move into a situation to buy the ground. And the way that we bought the ground, the reason why I'm kind of saying, saying this a little bit of detail, that the, the way we bought the ground was to form a PLC. So we did a share issue, a uh, public limited company. The actual cost of the ground was over two million. And um, uh, the share issue raised 1.1 million, um, which was a lot of money, and we couldn't really believe that you know that that could, that could happen. But um, one of the challenges most clubs find, and no doubt Dulwich will find it as well, is that um, is that it's revenue, you know, because it's easy to knock the big Premier League clubs and the clubs that are owned by wealthy individuals, but the way that football competes at the moment, particularly in the professional uh, arm of the game. It's money that talks, and uh, there's you know numbers of studies that are done that talk about how successful a club is pretty much directly related to um, to the budget it puts into its playing side, and um, that's no different in the league we're in now. It was no different than when we were in the Ryman Premier. Um, if you've not got close to the highest budget, you've got very little chance of going up. If you're close to the lowest, you've got a very good chance of going down. Um, as a professional club, we were lucky to get into the league a couple of years, three seasons ago. But in our first season, we were 18 minutes away from going straight back down. So, um, uh, the second season, 18 minutes away from going straight back down. So, that would really kind of um, destroy your football budget uh, at a stroke to go back into the conference for, for us. So, I think in terms of um, the challenges you, you face, um, you, we're very much volunteer run still. We have um, a board that consists of three volunteers, a uh, paid secretary, stroke operations manager, and um, the, um, they, that's been the case since we formed, really. There's, there's very little salary being paid to full-time staff in the club. When we were step five, um, going through up into the conference, um, that, that was still the case. I think the first full-time employee on the board was uh, the secretary, and that would have happened right, around about the middle of the year as we spent the Ryan and Prem. Um, so we've been very fortunate. We've probably had over the years close to three, four hundred people who've given time freely to varying degrees. Those that uh, the chief executive um, spends, you know, 60, 70 hours a week working for the club, and um, is very proud of saying that he gets paid a, a sovereign a year. So um, he doesn't take any money out of the club. So that, that's really the challenge: how you balance um, the volunteers with the, the paid people and how do you then get enough budget to pay what's left over to pay for a football club that gets you at a level you want to play at. Um, in terms of how we're run, we're fully owned by the, uh, the Lons Trust in all, to all intents and purposes. The reason that there's a kind of slight caveat to that is that the, um, the PLC that we formed to buy the stadium is a hierarchy that goes from the Industrial Problems Society to the PLC. The PLC owns the limited company. Club. Um, the PLC has got two classes of shares. One class is uh, worth one vote, and the other class is worth three votes. We only issued the one vote shares. All the three vote shares are held by the Dons Trust. We guaranteed at least a 75% ownership of all the assets of the PLC, the subsidiaries. Um, and uh, over the years, actually, we've brought back a lot of those shares through extended share issues and I think we now have something like 91% of the PLC shares. So um, I think the term that Joe may have been thinking of is a restricted action. We have a number of those embedded into our constitution now. Reserved, reserved, reserved actions. Reserved, reserved matters. Reserved matters. Reserved actions. Um, <laughs> the, um, these prevent uh, us from selling the ground, which is a bit contentious now. 
<laughs> might be something we, we might like to do, given that we want to go and buy a much more expensive one, um, to change the name of the society or the name of the club or to basically relocate it anywhere else. And there's a number of other ones which require sort of effectively greater than 75% of members to vote in favour of them. And, you know, things like 50% of the attendance at a meeting in person, which has to be at least 35% of the membership has to vote against it as well, so it can't just be done by a sort of um, proxy votes and um, postal votes. So um, that's our kind of ownership structure. Um, as I said, day-to-day -day challenges are around getting your revenue in, managing volunteers, keeping the enthusiasm going. But um, it, my own personal feeling, I mean, you know, it's been a great sort of 12, 13 years since we sat in that room in, um, in Wimbledon and decided to form the trust and look where we've ended up now. There's no reason why any club, if we can get the fans, I don't believe, really, we can get the fans to follow them, we can attract new fans, which the Chamley appear to be doing these days, can, can grow and become more successful to, to whatever level they, they aspire to. So, um, you know, if you've got realistic ambitions of maybe conference or conference south or something like that, there's no reason why a fan and a club can't get to that level. Um, we prove that you can go further than that, um, and it can be done. But um, you, know, you require a lot of dedicated people who are prepared to give up their time, um, a lot of their time, for a lot of years to make that happen. Um, but I'm sure, you know, most, most amongst most um, football clubs, there are people who feel like that, and uh, they are willing to do it. So. It's a labour of love, it's a yeah. Yeah. Um, but what better way than to, you know, own the club that you see out of the pitch. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Now I'm going to have an opportunity to, for you to ask questions. Um, if you'd like to, uh, when you're asking your question, you'd like to say who you want it to be directed to primarily. I mean, obviously, um, some questions might um, require an answer from all the panel. Um, okay, who, who wants to go first? Michael? Um, my question's more for Joe because you're the only one on the panel who's not really from a Phoenix club and you're still on the same... Uh, just about. Just, just about. Yeah. What, I mean, what, what sort of difficulties um, did you encounter in when you first acquired the club, when you first just acquired the club? Were, were there any sort of things particularly that you, that you didn't expect? Well, just repeat the question. Sorry, I need a question. Do you want to use the mic? Yeah, okay. Yeah. No, I need a question. There's no question. Sorry. Sorry. I, I was asking... Um, what difficulties Portsmouth encountered um, in the transition from moving from the same club to being a supporters' own club? Because the other three clubs on the panel are all Phoenix clubs. Um, whether there was anything in particular um, that they found difficult that they hadn't um, envisaged, or um, it's, it's a pretty vague question, but. Um, I think I'll take an answer. I mean, there's an endless, there's an endless list of, of things that we found difficult. I think it's part and parcel of acquiring a football club, wherever you're coming from, I mean, in whatever shape you're in. Um, you know, the, it's a learning curve, and I mean, you guys might be just starting at the bottom end of it. I'm only about half, we're only about halfway up it. Some other people might be a bit further on. And what I what I remember in the early days was was um, a lot of internal opposition, surprisingly from Pompey fans. You know, who, who, when you talked to them, were quite explicit about what they thought, what you were trying to do. Um, you know, it was four letter four letter language is quite common in Pompey. You know, you were frequently told to f off and don't waste my that kind of thing. Um, at the other end of the scale, I mean. We faced them, and I don't know how the, the, the amateur side or, or below the football league side operate, but um, the governing bodies were, were a combination of obstructive, you know, uh, and um, just disbelieving that, that a bunch of, as they perceived it, fans um, could possibly do such a thing as buy a football club, let alone run it. Um, there, there were an enormous number of, of, of internal problems going on at the same time as external ones. 
you know, it was four years of my life, and I must have aged at some time. I lost my husband, I must have aged about 30 years at time. You know, until we got to, to the final day. I mean, uh, it's an incredible feeling to achieve it, and I do hope you, you, you do get there. Um, but a lot of the time we were, I suppose, James, you probably agree, we were blazing a bit of a trail in terms of football league clubs. Yeah. Uh, because the size of the debt was just phenomenal. I mean, it was 130 million, and that was a conservative estimate, I can tell you. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, what did we pay? We paid off Mr. Chan and I, the Hong Kong Fu young man. I think we offered him 9 million, and he walked away with that. Um, how we raised it, the trust raised about three, three and a half million ordinary members. The rest of it came from, you know, the presidents. So, you know, what we achieved was, was phenomenal. But, you know, your vague question, um, well, I'm happy to talk to you after as if anything comes, comes to mind, but there's so many things um, that you will learn on the job. It's a learning on the job thing. You, you just have to, on occasions, we had to keep our heads down, decide what we were going to do, straight line, ignore the opposition, ignore the criticism, believe in what you're doing, um, and you'll get there. And we, and we, and the T-shirt, some people wanted to come out with their Pompey Trust, we did it. You know, one day I hope to say to see some of you people walking around with a T-shirt saying, Dulwich, we've done it. Um, who knows, you know. Um, uh, there's so many. I, it's, 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 such a broad, vague question. Sorry. Thank you, Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Who's next? Do you want to? Could you take the mic yeah, around, of Jack? Thank you. Can I give a question? Gentlemen, there at the bar. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. It's a question aimed at both Fisher and Enfield regarding the ground ownership. Basically, I think um, you mentioned Enfield uh, raised money for their ground partly through council. Uh, contribution and loans, and I presume the loans are just paid back through through revenue that you that you earn through through the club. But um, on on Fisher, I just wondered uh, how you raised the finance for the for the ground. Okay. Uh, good question. Um, despite what I said earlier about property developers. Um, <laughs> they have proved to have a, a bit of a use. So, Sammy, you'll remember Sammy, um, he, after his companies went bankrupt and the club uh, was liquidated, eventually Sammy himself went bankrupt. Um, and that left the asset of one of his companies, the, the Surrey Dock Stadium, in the hands of uh, the receivers. That was about three years ago. They put it up for sale. Um, and it was bought eventually by Fairview, Fairview New Homes Limited, um, based in Anfield. And um, they, they, um, they discovered fairly early on, with a bit of, a bit of nudging um, from uh, Supporters Direct and Sport England, that in order to get a development done on our old ground, they would probably have to find some way of helping us out um, and uh, to cut a long story short that uh, has turned into half a million pounds of section 106 money through Southwark Council being allocated towards the development of our new ground. Um, that's about 50%. The rest of the money is uh, some, fun some further funding provided by the council from other section 106 monies uh, from developments in the area. and. Uh, subject to approval, um, the, the gap will be closed by grants from the Football Foundation. Can I just add to that? Um, just to add to that, just, just to clarify, um, we, we had a, a one and a half million pound loan from um, Portsmouth City Council to enable us to initially buy back the ground, that's now been repaid, but we also had a property developer called Stuart Robinson, who's actually a Toffee, an Everton fan, um, who's become a bit of a Pompey fan because he's a major share, so he's one of the presidents now. He also bought the land around Fratton Park, um, which has enabled eventually the Tesco deal to go forward. Obviously the interest he had in that land was the deal he did with Tesco's. So, if you like, he got something out of it, we got something out of it. 
Um, and Tesco's got something out of it. Um, our contribution to our new stadium was approximately about £350,000. Now, some of that came from the Football Stadium Improvement Fund, which again is something that Dulwich Hamlet can apply for at the level that they're at. And uh, it has to be done in, very, in a very strict way. You can't start work before you actually make the applications in. And it's quite a tricky uh, um, process to go through, but certainly a very worthwhile one. Um, we've had to take some loans out. Um, we've got those loans down quite to a major extent already, um, certainly living within our means, the way we set our budget, for example, we look to see, now that we've been in the ground for three years, we know what the running costs are of the ground. So our first thing that we do is we work out what the running costs are, we work out other contingencies for what we want to spend during the season, and the balance is the plan budget. So it, it's that simple way in the way that we run our finances. Okay, thanks. Who's next? 